Father, well, we thank you that we have your word before us. We thank you that we have the opportunity to dig in and to learn things from you. We pray that you'll teach us with your, in your word. We pray that your spirit will be our teacher. And that the same one who inspired it will come and apply it to us. That we might live in its light, live by faith and feed on you and follow in your way. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. I got some really interesting people uh, who are friends with me on Google Plus now. And Google Plus is very new, which has come out in the last few weeks, and it, it's it's a very interesting way to be um, doing social networking. But the interesting thing about it is that not many people are on it yet, and so the people who are on it are all the sort of cutting edge, go ahead sort of you know young fellows who are all techie whiz or whatever, and me. And there's the dysfunction because <laughs> I'm on it clunking around as well. But because of that, it tends to be the people who are sort of a bit go-ahead, who run it at the moment. And they're the people you pick up friendships with. And I'm, I'm getting to know a guy in Australia who's doing a lot of work with Muslims in Australia. Wouldn't think that, would you? And he put something up on his uh, Google, Google Plus circle that I'm in the other day. It was a question, but like this. If you had to define the Christian faith in 20 words or less, what would you say? You have to define the Christian faith in 20 words or less. What would you say? And a lot of people were obviously coming back with all these long theological formulations with big words that nobody understood. I, I got bored of this. So I put up, get off your horse and drink your milk. Do you remember that John Wayne film? <laughs> I saw a look at recognition. Get off your horse and drink your milk. Well, you've got to get off your high horse. And turn from your sin. And trust in Jesus. And then when you've done that, you need to desire the pure milk of the word that you might grow thereby. Yeah. So a few people are coming up and say, oh, I'm not sure about the horse and the milk. <laughs> oh, you silly boy. Well, let me explain. <laughs> Fair play. Uh, it didn't sound like a very sort of doctrinally adequate theological um, definition of what a Christian was until I had the chance to explain. How would you, how would you put it? There's absolutely no doubt that most people in this world seem to describe Christianity in terms of the three R's. You know the three R's? Rules, robes and reverence. Right? That's the way most people think, isn't it? They think that's what Christianity is about. Rules, robes and reverence. Heaven help us. And the images that spring up in very many people's minds when they are asked to briefly define Christianity are just like that. But we've got oh so many illustrations in the media in, in, in recent months that none of that stuff actually has got any power at all to regulate Christian conduct or to form Christian character. Biblical Christianity is the very opposite of that three R's approach. And it does change a man or a woman, it does change them from the inside out, thoroughly and consistently. But only when grace is consistently embraced and applied. When the faith and the feeding and the following are put together as we were reading in John 6. Let's look here at the context of what Paul is saying. He's suggesting all along that uh, Paul is dealing here with a group of Celtic tribes people at the very edge of the Roman Empire. Now this is what's known as the North Galatian theory. Uh, I embrace it wholeheartedly by now because I've been working with it for a while. I also like the idea that Paul is dealing with Celts, because we have to do that, and an interesting bunch we all are. So there he is, dealing, I think, with this bunch of Celtic tribes people at the very edge of the Roman Empire, at the very edge of what would be called civilization in Paul's own day. They heard the gospel from Paul, who was there amongst them because of a humiliating illness, but he points out they, they didn't despise him for that. They helped him until he was well. And because he was there, he did what Paul always does, he shared his life with people. And he shared his life with people and that had an effect because his life is in Christ. This is what's required of us, isn't it? To share our lives with people and our life is in Christ. And they get to see Christ. And what's happened is those people, those Galatians, those Celtic hairy savages on the sort of edge of the empire, you know, like the people from around where I live, they, there they are, learning Jesus. And they turn from sin, they trust Christ, and their lives are transformed. They're pretty new Christians. But the gospel of God's free grace to sinners, apart from the law, has really taken root amongst them and it's profoundly changed their lives in fellowship with God. And, and now, what's happened is this. Having heard that this hairy bunch of tribes people have received the grace of God, 
some really keen tri types in, in the Jerusalem church, they decided to come down and train these lower life forms. Ever come across that? They come down to train them and get them in line with the law. And it's a nuisance and a threat because it takes them away from the gospel. Is that making sense? We're from the big church, we know what's true, we'll come and show you what's something going on. Good, good start, but we'll put you right now. Have you come across that? The person interacting with that developing situation is a guy called Paul. Not a person ignorant of the law. Doesn't need their help in this way. More learned, more well read, more prominent within Judaism than any of these people who come down from the Jerusalem church to try to draw the Galatians in, into that signing marked Judaism. And his meeting with the risen Lord Jesus on the Damascus road has convinced him that Judaism was empty without Jesus. The vital piece was missing. And that grace was the only way to be saved and to live saved. We saw that last time. Salvation is by grace through faith, faith alone, through, from first to last. So the context of the situation is the Judaizers are trying to push legal observance, which doesn't save, and has only got the power of your sinful self to change your sinful human nature. Why ever did anybody think that was going to work? Trying to push legal observance back onto a bunch of really very Gentile believers who've come to trust in Christ and been saved by grace through faith alone, having heard the preaching of an uber-Jewish bloke who'd come through a powerful experience of Christ to know that what they were talking to these Galatians was rubbish. It's a mess, isn't it? You can expect that Paul is going to be very, very clear on the issues. And against that sort of context, and against that sort of background, Paul speaks out. Galatians 5.16 So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Sinful nature desires what's contrary to the Spirit, the Spirit what's contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. See? If you're living the Christian life, as distinct from the moralist's life, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Because you have from him both the strength and the motivation to deal with your sinful nature. If you're living by the rule book in the strength of your sinful emanation, you haven't got a chance because your flesh doesn't want to be managed. There's more. The acts of the sinful nature, says Paul, are obvious, and then he gives a gory list. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such things, in relation to them, there's no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature, done with its passions and desires. Now then, here's the point. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Here's the context. Paul is setting out his direct response to the Judaizers' teaching. He is saying it is completely at variance with the essence of the gospel. Because chapter 5, verse, verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Not for law again. Stand firm then. Don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. How does that work? Well, we've seen in recent weeks. What happens when you've got the law is at least there's some external constraint on your behaviour. Rather after the fashion of one of those old-fashioned ladies' corsets. Not the sort of thing? Keeps it all in. Right? External constraint. And what happens when... You turn from sin and trust in Jesus as you chuck it away. Ah. So the Judaizers say, but you can't chuck it away because it will all go flop. And Paul says, no. What happens when you chuck it away is you work on your muscle tone. And you're holding it in from the inside out. Does that make sense? That was a pretty, pretty stupid illustration, wasn't it? But, but you see the point? That's the difference. That's how it works. Because if you've become a Christian, 
you've not only been set free from legal regulation from the outside, you've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, who transforms you, reorders you from the inside out, in the image and the likeness of the God you're now in a living relationship. More than that, it's the relationship that regulates your future conduct. Now you've seen this happen. You've seen the young fellow who is a bit of a tear and he's a bit of a lad and he's, he's all pumped and he's all action and there's a girl in his life. Or girl, right? <laughs> Boys is going to be interesting. And, you know, things go on in the normal course of event and they marry. And a year later, the guy who walked down the aisle is not the person she's still married to. Because that relationship has remained, has changed, has transformed the way he is and sees things and things. Now ladies, don't get your hopes up, okay? You know, you know, the, old, you know the old joke about marching down the aisle, you know, and, and, and she'd been told what she had to do in the course of the service, you know, she had to walk down the aisle, stand at the altar and sing the hymn, yeah? She was so nervous, the beggar gave her three words, right? I'll alter him. She walked down and went, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. Never that one. It's not like that, okay? It's not like that at all. But there is this way, this way in which being in relationship transforms you. And that's how Christian character is changed. In fellowship with the Spirit of God. Making sense? So I say, says verse 16, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful human nature. Now against that background, and in that context, Paul speaks this verse, verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit.